Welcome. Thank you so much for coming out uh, to hear us speak tonight. Uh, I'm Tyler Mitchell. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Impact and have three of our uh, incredible shapers um, for the program uh, that they're going to be working with writers uh, super, super closely for the next uh, eight weeks, who I'd like to introduce. Uh, I will start at the end with Hunter Covington. Hunter, uh, he ran alone together for The Lonely Island. He wrote uh, on uh, Black AF, The Carmichael Show, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, uh, Community, and my name is Earl, so he knows a thing or two about being funny and telling jokes, which is why I try not to be funny when I'm with him. Um, <laughs> next to him is his amazing wife, uh, Stacy uh, Traub. Uh, Stacy created and executive produced Notes from the Underbelly, which was on ABC for two years. She was also the executive producer and showrunner of The Real O'Neills and Blackish on ABC. She wrote and produced uh, Glee and The Trophy Wife. And she is the record-setting uh, shaper for Impact. She's been a part of every program that we've done, and she's overseen 14 projects uh, for us, and many of which have gone on to have great success. So um, welcome, Stacy. And then next to me is uh, Victoria's own Sean Grant, who is a multi-award winning screenwriter. Uh, he's had movies that have premiered at Cannes and at Toronto and Sundance. Uh, most recently, his movie Knit Ram uh, won Best Actor at Cannes, uh, also won eight awards at the Australian uh, Academy Awards, including Best Film, Best Director, and Best Original Screenplay. Um, Sean also wrote uh, Penguin Bloom, The Tr History of the, of the Kelly Gang, uh, Snowtown, and in TV, he wrote Deadline, Gallipoli, and the series. Gallipoli. Gal I'll, correct Gal you there. Gallipoli? I'll correct you there. Okay. That's all right. We'll work on that. All right. <laughs> and the, should uh, we start over? We should, should we start over? <laughs> probably. Yeah. I mean, you got a lot of credits. Yeah, yeah. You know, no, no, so, no, you've yeah. done well. You've um, done well. And the series finale of Netflix's Mindhunter. Um, a little bit about Impact, uh, If for those who, who don't know about Impact, Impact is a company that was started four years ago um, by Brian Grazer, Ron Howard, uh, and myself. Um, Brian had this idea to create a technology company to help solve problems for the entertainment industry. And if you know anything about Brian Grazer, um, he is an incredibly curious person, and he knows a lot about a lot of things. And he had met someone named Paul Graham, who started a company called Y Combinator, that's a startup accelerator um, for internet startups. And he called me, uh, Brian, one day and said, there's this company that thousands of people from around the world apply to, and then a few people get in, and then they put them through a boot camp, and on the other side of that boot camp comes Airbnb, Dropbox, Instacart, Quora, and you know, Reddit, several other you know, major multi-billion dollar companies. So if they can do that in three months, shouldn't we be able to do that with movies and television shows? And I thought, yeah, that seems like you know, very logical. And so what sort of started as this extra credit um, project, I was an executive uh, um, over there for, for several years, um, turned into this real company. And um, the challenge was, you know, these aren't business plans. You know, uh, writing is subjective, creativity is subjective, all of which is true. However, there are people whose subjectivity over time tends to connect with certain or wider audiences than others. And Ron and Brian's track record um, um, for the kinds of movies and shows they make um, tend to have a lot of appeal. And so we ended up creating a system um, to be able to democratize access to the entertainment industry. Because uh, unfortunately, it's incredibly hard to break into Hollywood as a writer if you're in Los Angeles. If you're anywhere else in America or anywhere else in the world, it's like you almost have no chance. Um, it's, it's really hard to, get to break in. Um, people are not allowed to read your screenplay. Like uh, unsolicited materials is sort of this big no-no. So there's this catch-22 of wanting to, you know, discover and embrace you know new talent, and yet there there was no way um, to really offer that at scale. And so now, uh, four years later, um, we've had over 80,000 people apply from 140 countries. Um, we have uh, after this program, we'll have over 100 writers that have gone through Impact. Um, who have gone on to have you know, tremendous success. We've, we've uh, in Impact Australia, um, two thirds of the projects that have been developed in our eight week boot camps have been um, sold to studios um, or set up with, with major uh, producers. Um, Impact as a whole has had eight movies greenlit. Um, 
Uh, we've had two series on the air. One, one uh, wasn't developed through Impact, but Bre Brendan Fletcher, who was a part of uh, Impact with his writing partner, Debbie Telfer, uh, was on AMC. And then uh, Megan Palinkas, who's with us, uh, she's show running um, what is now the most popular show in Australia, Heartbreak High. Uh, congratulations to Megan. She, she's here tonight. Um, was, was also in, in one of our, our programs. And as I, I was saying earlier, the, the reason why we came to Australia, um, there's two reasons. One is because there are a tremendous number of, of talented storytellers in this country, and storytelling is um, very much at the root uh, of, of Australia. Uh, and also the support that uh, the government has for the arts. And, uh, and we formed some amazing partnerships with, uh, with Greg Basser and with uh, uh, Screen Australia and Screen Victoria. Um, and, and together we're able to, uh, to put on this, this amazing program for the last three years. And we're here in person for the first time. Um, and every week we bring in speakers like the ones that we have here today to really kind of get real and talk about you know, writing and craft and also the ins and outs of how Hollywood, uh, how Hollywood and the entertainment industry um, works to kind of demystify um, you know, the process, which I think for, for anybody who's not in the industry, um, I knew when I was 19 trying to break into the industry, it seems like a very obscure, like formidable fortress to try to, to break into. And so hopefully um, we'll, we'll, we'll try to break it down and make it feel a little more accessible for you. Um, the first question I have for the group is, and Stacey, uh, we can start with you answering, is I think one of the misconceptions I realized as I was preparing for tonight is that writers think that like writing screenplays and shows is about writing and about like a singular um, pursuit when like filmmaking and creating television shows is m incredibly collaborative, you know, from start to finish. Ron will say a movie is made three times. First you make it in development, then you make it in production, and then you make it again in the edit and post. And so even if you are the writer, you're gonna be working with producers and executives or actors and directors and taking in, you know, input from people. Um, if you're on a television show, you're gonna have a, a, writing, you know, a writing staff of, of different people. And so I guess, what, what advice do you all have um, in terms of, of what collaboration like in film and television looks like? Oof, okay, uh, that's a <laughs> tough one. Um, I'll just start with the fact that when I started, I, I went to film school, I went to American Film Institute, and I was kind of very like, I want to make films, I didn't care about TV. Um, and then luckily I wound up becoming a writer's assistant on a show called Mad About You. And when I got into that writer's room and I learned how you know TV shows are made, um, especially comedy rooms, the collaboration was like my favorite part, like the writer's room idea. It just blew me away. I had no idea that that's how TV was made. I kind of knew about screenwriting and films and I'm like, the writer is a solo person alone in a room, you know, with the screen in front of you, just trying to make it happen. And to see a room full of people working off each other's ideas and building and sometimes you don't have the answer, um, but you throw something out and then someone builds off of that. I was just like, this is where I need to be. Um, and then I was like, this is it, TV's for me. So I, I, love, I love that you, um, you get to do that. Now, when you're in development, you, know, you start with an idea, you have your idea, and then you, maybe you find a producer and that producer has a deal with a studio, and if they like your idea and you start working together, you're collab those people are collaborating with you. And in a perfect world, those people, you know, you're a team. Um, and you see eye to eye and you're trying to craft this thing that you're then gonna go sell, right? And then the next step would be, let's say you sell it, then the buyer is on the team and then whoever the buyer is, the network or the streamer, suddenly they're kind of your boss and you've got your partners and then you're hopefully, you're making them happy while keeping your voice intact. And then if you get to make a pilot, all of a sudden there's more people, you know, then you've got a team of people and a director and 
you know, a cinematographer and all of that, and then you're collaborating with those people, still trying to keep your vision intact, but understanding you're gonna have to compromise. And then in a perfect world, if you get a show, it expands to even more people. So um, in a way, you're kind of, you're training yourself for what the ultimate goal would be is to have, you know, your own show. And at that point, um, the, the, I think the more um, you get, the, the less writing you get to do <laughs> too. So you have to understand that that pure vision is now gonna turn into something else. But it's kind of this amazing thing. You're gonna bring on writers who are helping you see that vision and then you're also gonna get their ideas. So it just keeps expanding into what I feel is like better and better. My, the, my least, I mean, I love writing, but my least favorite part is just like being alone in a room. <laughs> and um, that's why I feel lucky that Hunter's a writer too, because at the early stages when I'm just breaking a story, I need, I'm like trained to do it with people. <laughs> so he gets stuck with um, having to help me and vice versa. Yeah. I hope you, I answered that I right. question? Yeah. Do you write together? I, I don't know this. Um, like some that. projects, yes. So. Um, we write separately and together. Yeah, so I was talking about, we just went out with a pitch last week, mm. and we were pitching together, which people were excited about, because <laughs> we were working together. Um, yeah. Sean, what about you? I mean, you, a lot of your movies are kind of a, a bit more auteur-driven, maybe, or you're the sole, the, the sole writer on it. How, how do you approach collaboration, or like, what's your experience? Uh, oh, I mean, I just, I like people. So I, I, like, I never wanted to be a novelist, because, I generally like people, some writers don't <laughs> and, and hide away, but I actually like working in a group. So it was really appealing to me. Um, I find my day to day is exceptionally lonely um, because I'm just me in a room, whether it's film or TV, more often than not the TV I write. We, we have super short writers rooms here. We don't, you know, like I speak to some of my writer colleagues in. LA and you know they're they're there for months you know we'll we'll be there for a week <laughs> maybe two right. and we're we're pretty happy and that's great and then you're on your own so even television um, so any chance I get to work with anyone the actors the directors the producers the state and federal governments you know giving notes and things I just accept it and enjoy that process um, because otherwise it's just us, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just me in a room, and um, and I like talking about film and television. Um, so I would just, yeah, I just suggest to those particularly involved in this program, program is um, enjoy the collaboration because it's it's a lot of the job, and don't be too sensitive. Um, yeah. <laughs> I always say if you're going to be sensitive, be a novelist. Yeah. Because um, ninety percent of my day is just being told what's wrong with it. Yeah. And then you have to remind yourself, oh, if they haven't mentioned it, they liked it. Like, I had to learn that pretty early. That's right. like, so you pat yourself on the back. Because people just don't have time to, no. to compliment you on the good stuff sometimes. So. Yeah. One of the things that we tell writers is, like, if someone is taking the time to actually talk to you and give you notes, it means uh, yeah. they like it. Yeah, like, yeah. It means, like, they're, they're giving your ta their time away um, when, you know, a lot of executives will just say, pass, you know, or they're, they're, not, in, they're not interested. Like, the, the, the more notes someone's giving you often, like, that means the more invested they are in that project succeeding. Mm. Yeah, the engagement is the compliment. Yeah. In a lot of ways. Yeah. yeah. Um, what about in comedy writers' rooms, Hunter? How would you say that that's, like, like pure sort of comedy, like, writers' rooms? How does that differ from other rooms that you've been in? I've only been in pure comedy <laughs> rooms. <laughs> <laughs> or well, from I, what you... Um, <laughs> I mean, I think the biggest difference uh, of Sean, what Sean's saying, um, a lot of drama rooms are put together at the beginning of a season and then everyone's kind of sent off to write scripts and then it's n they never return back to this thing. Whereas in a comedy room, especially, it, it's changing now a little bit with streaming, but in terms of like network television in America, you know, you're, you're coming up with stories together, you're outlining together, you're, you're, you know, you go off to write a first draft, but then you bring it back and everyone reads it and everyone gives their thoughts. So it's a much more like fully collaborative experience the whole time. Um, and then if you're doing like a multicam show where you're doing like run throughs during the week and having like a live show with an audience, that's even more everyone's in the same 
foxhole pretty much the whole time, um, which is great because you get everybody's perspective on things. And, you know, comedy is hard because a lot of it is we've seen that before, we've heard that joke before, but luckily you have a bunch of people that can help you come up with other things. Right. I, I love the idea of that. When my, my comedy writer friends were always going on where best joke wins yeah. mm -hmm. and you can steal yeah. it and you get the credit for it on yeah. your episode. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. I was like, yeah. we need to bring that in. I mean, actually we did in, um, in a couple of shows I've done, uh, Mindhunter being one, mm. which is uh, David the Creator was like, Sean, you write this character really well. And I went and wrote him for every mm -hmm. episode, which was really strange, cool. so just doing his scenes. So I think it's slowly coming in a drama where it's, and it was just, you know, don't worry about credits and things. It's, it all kind of pans out and works out. Yeah, I don't know why they, make it better. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why they don't do round tables and punch ups more. I around, agree. Around tables where you actually pay a group of writers to come in. Um, it means your movie or show is close to getting made, and everyone just pitches and contributes their best ideas mm. um, and lines and jokes or character things. And and that writer, whoever the the writer is that's going to be integrating those notes, like they get the credit. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. you know that's um, so. I worked as a writer's assistant on a show called Yes, Dear, and that was like I was a writer's assistant, very green. Um, but I got my first joke in a show in an episode that we were shooting. And the person who wrote the show, we were walking to stage one day, and he goes, I love that joke. You know why? Because my family th was going to think that I wrote it. <laughs> yeah. I like, okay. Yeah. But yeah, that's the, you know, especially when you're writing a comedy and you're like, I need three jokes a page or whatever. Like, I have to keep coming up with jokes. It, there's a certain point where you're sitting with the script and you've got nothing left, and then you bring it in and everyone comes up with jokes and goes, oh, well, why didn't you do this? And you're like, oh, shit, this is great. So I think that like that is the, great, the greatness of the collaboration and the writing process. Right. There's also something about when other people are punching up your script and giving you jokes that um, it's easier. I always find it easier to rewrite. It's the worst thing when, when you have to rewrite your script and you're sitting in the room and everyone's giving you jokes and you're like, why didn't I think of that? But then when it's not your script, it's so fun. There's something... Which, which I think is why I like doing this program, is like when it's not your baby, you, can, you have some distance from it and it's like easier to you know, fix the problem or give the joke. So that's what's also fun too. I love rewriting other people's scripts. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm, that's like, I'm not saying to you. Too. But that's yeah, the yeah. easy, I mean. It yeah. is the easiest thing it, to yeah. do. Yeah. It's you, yeah, if you, yeah. spend a, you spend a week, generally you spend a week writing a script for a TV show and you've written what you think is the best version of this outline that you've all agreed to, and you have some jokes from the room, and then you have some jokes of your own, and you hand in this thing. And some shows that you work on, the showrunner will like give you notes on the script, and they're like, we'll make this scene better, and you're like, I did. Like, I did. <laughs> I, I, this, this is, is what I thought version. was great, and they're yeah. like, yeah, but it just doesn't work. And you, you're just, you're, you know, you've hit a wall, and you're like, nah, let's just bring it into the room where 10 people can look at it and give their ideas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think rewriting yourself is like, is so difficult. Also, I think rewriting is the easiest thing in comparison. You have to, particularly those about to go on this journey, is to remind yourself that creating the original concept and building that scaffolding is the hardest thing. Because sometimes you come in and you, yeah, like was mentioned there, someone will say, oh, why didn't I think of that? Why didn't I make that scene better? But you've done so much work to get it to here. Anyone can come in and make one scene better or once, you know, I've seen actors that are like given one line in a scene and they're like, oh, I completely yeah. changed that scene and made it. And I was like, yeah, sure you did. Yeah, right. But well, that's fine, you let them go. But, um, you know, we can all make it, we can all just add a moment to it. And it can be overwhelming when you, you feel like, oh, why didn't I do that? And I, I, I'm, you know, but you've, it's so much harder to do the groundwork, yeah. you know. Well, well, there's a great, there's also just quickly, there's a great thing in comedy writing rooms where someone will pitch something, the smallest change, and then immediately say, save the show. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. This should be a, an exclam instead of a period yeah. or vice versa. Yeah, yeah. I did, I saved it. Yeah. 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 Although I think it's, I think there's a, a big difference. Um, I, I sort of fell, in, fell into writing. Like I was producing and um, I would write a lot of stories and come up with my own ideas for movies like the way that, that uh, Brian would. Um, and it was always very good at structure. Um, 
but when I started working with like really talented writers who write exceptional dialogue or exceptional characters, I was like, I'm not, I am not a very talented writer, um, but I can build this, a scaffolding or a structure for something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I think it's also just people knowing where their talents are and, mm -hmm. and lean into your strengths and don't necessarily try to, if you're not good at structure, you're probably, like, you can learn a lot of stuff, but um, like voice and, and just you know, language and the way that people talk, like, you, those are things that are coming so much from the writer, they can't, mm. they, they can't really be, be taught. And, and I think that this goes back to, you know, go be a novelist if you don't want to work with people and if you don't want to go out into the world and have experiences and meet a bunch of people that allows you to become a better writer and be able to tell better stories mm. just by being more social. Right. Do you have a preference, Sean? You work in both TV and, and features. Do you have a preference on form or like storytelling um, length? Or? I mean, I think Stacy said before, she got into this industry because she wanted to make films. And that was my um, kind of story. Why you said how, how you fell into what you did, what, how I became a writer was, uh, I was like, I just want to make films. And I looked at VCA directing, and I couldn't afford the course. Mm. <laughs> and it was too, you know, like, we have this system where you gotta pay it back. And I was like, oh, that'll take me too long. And RMIT was down the road, and it was a TAFE at the time, and it cost me, I should say it to the VCA people, but it was like a couple of hundred bucks. It was like, and I'm a writer. That's literally the reason. And, um, and I still, you know, you think, was it the right thing? Should I direct whatever else? But that's kind of how I came into it. So film was always my great love. Obviously, as television has gotten better and better, um, I've done more and, and more of that. But uh, look, I mean, I don't, I never see myself, um, I know we're doing the NCIS Sydney and things. I don't think I could go into that world. I know Shane who, who did a lot of it and he could churn out those, you know, those episodic, where they do 20 episodes a thing. That's not me. Uh, I'm writing a series at the moment that's like limited series and it feels like I don't look at it greatly different to a film. Mm. Um, so that's probably more my world. Mine Hunter was the same. Like, um, I was, yeah, it was just I just looked at it as cinema, and the people that worked on it kind of were based in that cinema world anyway. So um, yeah, I, you know, it's, yeah. it's all about the story, really. But. Yeah, a lot of people may not know that when I first started working in, it was the movie business, right? Like yeah. you were in the movie business, and TV was like way down here. You know, like it was not given any. No. Shred of in ITV, of which is what you would get for actors who are not interested in TV, which I don't yeah. even think exists anymore because it means not interested in TV. Yeah, yeah. you'd yeah. get cast lists when you're trying to like cast your TV if you're doing a pilot, and all the people who you desperately wanted to cast, it would just say NITV, and you're like, God damn it! And now, <laughs> now it's like everyone will do yeah. any TV. <laughs> any situation somebody will do. Yeah, you know, just it takes the right thing, but yeah. How has um, comedy evolved? You know, like there was a while where it's like, oh, comedy's so hard, and you know, getting feature comedies like made is, is still like kind of a, an uphill battle. Yet, it seems like there's also some pretty incredible show and shows and kind of like groundbreaking shows. I think in in comedy, like what, what kind of trends are you guys seeing from like a writing perspective in terms of how comedy storytelling is changing? I mean, I feel like with streaming. You know, network comedy had like a certain, okay, wait, let me go back a second. So like first you had multi-camera sitcoms and that was it, right? Um, when I did Notes from the Underbelly, which was 2006, uh, yeah. 2007, six, yeah. it was the first single camera comedy that Warner Brothers had ever done. They'd never done one. They didn't want to do one because um, it cost them more money than I to do. I still think they don't want to do They one. still don't want to yeah. do them. No one really wants to do them. They, they would, every studio would love to just do a multi-camera comedy. And I'll just tell you quickly, if you don't know the difference, multi-camera comedies, you're shooting on a stage with or without an audience, like How I Met Your Mother is a, is a hybrid, which means it's like a multi-cam without an audience. But, or Seinfeld is a multi-cam and Friends is a multi-cam. And, but like The Office, Parks and Rec are single camera, shot more like a movie over the course of a week. The multicam is more like a play where sort you're rehearsing. Like, sort of like anything pre-arrested uh, development. Yeah. Right, it's true. almost yes. all multicams. Um, 
So that, so that was a big shift. It's funny now because most people have written single camera and now the fact that like we've both worked on multi, they're like, oh, you have multi-cam experience? Also, by the way, it doesn't matter. Like, I mean, it's the same. <laughs> you're, just, you're just writing. A um, story is a story. A story is a story. A yeah. yeah, exactly. So that was a big shift to kind of get into single cam. Single cam also, I'd say like less, less jokey. Um, a lot of times in a single camera show, the joke is in the cut. Um, so you're seeing like the flip on the other side. Then with streamers, I feel like comedies became dramedies, you know? So you had like, you had like transparent, um, smaller, Fleabag, Fleabag. catastrophe. Very like auteur driven. Yeah, like, and you so know, that voice. was super exciting. Um, and that's about the time that I felt like, oh, I'm gonna try and shift out of network because I want to be telling stories that um, are just a little darker, a little edgier. Um, and then of course, you know, as, as I'm getting into streaming and stuff, they're now, I, I like created, didn't create, I, I was working on a pilot very personal that was kind of like my transparent whatever, very uh, about my life and went and pitched it and I heard from every streamer, they don't want that <laughs> anymore. They want hard hitting, funny network comedy. So it's kind of all come back around like, we're pitching to Netflix next week and they're like a family comedy and they're like, that's what they want. So they don't want these kind of, sm it's almost like they were making indie films and now they want to make blockbusters. <laughs> so that little niche thing that we were like, let's get, go into this. So I actually took my idea that I wanted to sell as a show and I did write it as a novel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, screw you guys, I'm writing it as a novel. Yeah. yeah, I'm tired of working with people. No, I'm <laughs> fine, but anyway. Um, so it's so, it's, I guess, and the, the thing is, is you can't, whatever's happening and you go, oh, okay, this is what's happening, I'm gonna try and tailor my piece to this. By the time you're doing it, it's changed. Right, and the person who's running Amazon or Netflix or whoever, you're like, oh, this person loves this. They're gone by the time you're pitching it. So I think it goes to show you, like, do the thing that's in your heart and don't try and guess what people want because you're by the time you get there, they're gonna want something else. So I think there's something freeing in that to not try and chase what's happening or what's hot because you'll never get it. I've always, I would say. I've always wondered why, especially in television, I think it's less with movies, but every year that's like, you get the network needs and there's like a shift, right? Yeah. And I would say the most profound one that I experienced was a, a friend of mine co-created uh, Royal Pains, right. which went like 11 or 13 seasons or something on USA. And USA was Blue Sky Network, Burn Notice, Monk, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Dar is a huge fan of uh, a lot of USA, uh, USA is shows. It, is it characters belong here? Characters, characters welcome. Characters welcome. Characters welcome and then Mr. They got like they got Mr. Robot. They like got Mr. Robot off the ground, and they decided they wanted to just like become HBO. Mm -hmm. They were the number one cable channel in the world at this time, and then they decided that they didn't want to do that. And I'm just I I I, I want and now they're they're not doing well. And I wonder how those decisions get made, or why people these shifts in kind of consciousness of what people well, want. Well, we just pitched a Peacock. And uh, we were informed a few days afterwards that Peacock is not doing comedy anymore, which... Yeah. <laughs> that explains why they got Pete Davidson's new show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, three months ago, it was like, Peacock's the home of comedy. And yeah. then it's like, we're not doing comedy at all. And so you're like, oh, oh okay. Thanks for telling us after. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, do you... I mean, do you, uh, when you're writing, Sean, um, is, it all about the, is it all about the story? Are you, are you ever thinking about yeah, the, the My agent everything? wishes I did, yeah. but no, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm bad. I'm trying to guess things, I, um, no, I just, I always say I write for an audience of one, sadly. I know, I hate hearing those <laughs> things. But with, a, with, the, with, with an asterisk, uh, which is that I tend to think that there are enough people like me that will go to see these things. So if I like it, then I hope that, th I'm not so weird that there's only one, you know, I, I have taste so tight that only I can like it. And it seems to have worked out all right. Um, I think that there is, like I know that, you know, 
that people would like this sort of thing. So I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's impossible to chase. You know, there's Stranger Things is out. So what's the next Stranger Things? And you see hybrids of it, and they never quite work like that. Yeah. And it's the next original thing that's the next Stranger Things. It's not the. Yeah. And they also, um, you know, we're kind of like talking a little inside Hollywood here, but like Stranger Things was created by the Duffer Brothers, who created nothing before, mm. right? But yet, in in, in television especially, um, there are these things called auspices, and auspices means you know like the street cred of your project because of who's attached, the non-writing producer, whether it's a, you know Imagine or Jerry Bruckheimer or um, a comedy brand, Steve Levitan, whomever, or if you know people at this level are attached to oversee your show or be on the show, you know, that someone has stamped, like, this is a good idea. And Sean Levy did that for Stranger Things. But they're so hesitant to take a chance on new voices, yet, yeah. yet you know, Fleabag, hmm. like, first show. Stranger Things, first show. Hmm. Um, Issa Rae, first show. Right. And, but I think we should also talk about Everyone passed on Stranger Things. Oh, yeah. And so, on Fleabag. And on Fleabag. And on Sopranos. Um, and yeah. on Breaking Bad. And, and on CSI. And on, and on Survivor, mm. just well, to say. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of huge mistakes made. But the other thing about the, the Stranger Things and everything, those dudes just love 1980s Steven Spielberg and all of those references. So they're not even coming up with, you have to come up with the most original idea, just as long as you have a story and a way to package it and a way to tell it. I think that, and obviously those two guys are super passionate about what they're into. So I think that's what sells the show, you know? Yeah, my, like, my agent, um, you know, reps Phoebe Waller-Bridge. Well, my old agent, but that's a whole story. Anyway, <laughs> but, uh, no, he, you know, we would talk about Fleabag, and he'd say, you know, everyone came to him afterwards, like, why didn't you bring me Fleabag? And he's like, because you never would have, you didn't want it then, you wouldn't have bought it. And then I said, well, what about, because the thing I was developing was also similar, whatever. And he goes, oh, they wouldn't buy it now either. Like if you pitched Fleabag right now, you wouldn't sell it. Right. <laughs> so it's just this weird luck and timing and the right person in the right place. Well, like a show like The Bear, I don't know if that's here yet or not, mm. but, um, I'm like pretending like it's the 80s, like you're not gonna, <laughs> you'll get this in like six or seven years. Um, but like, it's about a chef. that's a show where we tried to do a chef kind of show, food driven show, restaurant show for a really long time. And that was like, no one will make this. Nobody wants to do a restaurant show. Everyone hates it. Kitchen Confidential failed. Like it's- I was just, on that show, but yeah. It failed. So it was Bradley, so it was Bradley well, Cooper. I don't mean to With deliver Bradley this. Cooper. No. But yeah, no. also Bradley Cooper. I mean, can you imagine having Kitchen Confidential property and getting Bradley Cooper? It's, like, amazing. But, you know, the bear is just such a, so specific, and it was clearly, like, this passion project from these people that hit with, with uh, the people at FX. And I told my, uh, my agent and my manager, I was like, I can't really do the bear. Like, I don't. It's not really funny, and like it's not my exactly my thing. And they were like, "Oh, the people at FX that developed are gone. Like they're not even there anymore. Don't worry, nobody's gonna want the bear." <laughs> so then you're like, "Well, so there's no lessons from this? <laughs> like, <laughs> this is just this big hit show that doesn't teach us anything. <laughs> that doesn't help us sell our show. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> sounds about right. So that's that's kind of what the reality. I mean, is. I think oh. there's a little bit of uh, when Lost was hit there was like everybody wanted their lost and there were literal like lost clones that yeah. were like, you could see CBS was trying to do, I think they had a show called Threshold. Under the Dome. Again, with yeah. they had Peter Dinklage in a show, which is like just, they barely missed it. But um, I think there's a lot of stink on how much chasing there was in the 2000s, early 2010s. And so I think that it is hard to go, oh, the bear, I got my version of it. It's like, well, no, what's, your own version of it, your own version of your own show. I guess my favorite thing, actually, that was just making me think of like how the British show Coupling was like their version of Friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there was an American version of Coupling. Yeah. Like, and I'm just like, at NBC, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you're 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 copying your own <laughs> show. <laughs> just come up with a new show. 
I know. It's, it, well, we could talk about re uh, reboots versus originals too. It's yeah. Like, like sure. so many of the shows that we just mentioned are all all originals, and like Abbott Elementary is a huge show, also an original. Yet they keep rebooting. They're rebooting Quantum Leap. Like they keep rebooting all of these. Also, there's a show called Reboot now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's talk about rebooting. Re yeah. Yeah. Right, but it's like uh, the importance of IP and how that has been uh, the past five years or so. It's like, is it a comic book? Is it already a novel? Is it a, like, what can we have to a say? A New Yorker article. A New Yorker article. Yeah. <laughs> um, to the point where the agency that we're both at um, has a department that will help you create like a f book proposal, which is just sort of your pitch turned into a book proposal, and then they'll send it to the network being like, this is a book coming out, but it's not <laughs> like, it's just your TV pitch. It's yeah. so bizarre. You don't have to write the this, book. I'll tell you a true story. I started, I, I started working for, for Brian, and I came up with this idea for a movie um, one night, and I came and I pitched it to him the next day, and Brian's I got a very high bar for Brian to like something, and he was like, oh my God, this is, this is great. He said, it would be so amazing if it could be a book first. <laughs> and yeah. I had just, um, we had just like won a, a bidding war and Ron was gonna direct this movie called The Girl Before, um, which we sold to Universal. It ended up getting turned into a TV series at, at HBO. And so I called the writer, um, <laughs> I mean, I called up the writer, Tony, and I said, um, hey Tony, listen, um, I hope you, the, I know you're a best-selling author. It was like a New York Times, like number one best-seller. I'm like, I know you're a best-selling author. I came up with an idea um, for a movie that we think could be a, a good book, and I think it might be up your alley. And so I pitched it to him, and, and I said, and I'm sorry, like, I understand that this might be super offensive. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> to, to do, anyway, long story short, he loved the idea. He wrote the book. It became a best-seller in, in the UK. It's called The Perfect Wife. And imagine, and so, the, but Imagine gets to have the, the rights to it, and he wrote the book. So we quite literally wrote a book. So, so to, you could to, make so a movie. So we had it happen and do a movie. Yeah. I mean, the, but the, to be honest, that's what you're doing. Like, Well, hold you... on. No. <laughs> I, well, yes. I mean, I was, OK, wait, wait. I just want to defend it, though. Like, I was I was. But I don't think out... you should defend it. I think it's savvy. But go ahead. But I want to say that I, having written the book, so I went out to pitch this very personal idea. Because of COVID, I had a lot of time to work on it. So I had a pitch, and I, had, I wrote the first three episodes because it works where like each episode is from a different character's point of view, and I wanted to like proof of concept and show how it worked. And then I broke, you know, it was gonna be 10 episodes, so I knew where the story went. And I went and pitched it, you know, virtually to every place. Pitch went great, left behind my three scripts, um, and everybody was like, everyone passed. Everyone was like, we love it, but we have a show about a middle-aged woman already, or <laughs> we love it, but, you know. And everyone across the board was like, we just, but we love the writing. We love the writing, you know? And I'm like, okay, um, but you don't want to make the show. So, doesn't pay the mortgage. The love doesn't pay the yeah, mortgage. Yeah, the love of the writing. Mm -hmm. So then I was like, fuck it, like, they love the writing, I'm just gonna write it. You know, and so, and it's my very, it's such a personal story, I'm like, I have to tell it, so I'm like, I'm just gonna write the book, I don't have to worry about who I'm casting, I don't have to worry about how I shoot it. I'm just writing the book, I'd basically broken the book, so I sat down and wrote it. Um, and then everyone I tell that I wrote a book, they're like, well, then you can make the show, like, that's what you can do, but I, and then I say, yes, that would be great, like, that would be the cherry on top of the sundae, but, I actually just want, like, if I can get it published and get people to read it, then I'm, like, that to me is what the goal is. And because I got to tell the story the way I wanted to tell it, I didn't have to compromise. Um, I actually, I don't know if I should tell this story, but like I, I pitched Sharon Horgan, really liked it, and you know, we met, and there's, you know, there's characters that are based on my kids, and you know, she likes stuff that's very edgy and very dark, so she's like, I really like it, but, I can't do her accent. So she said, I really liked it, but um, could maybe the, the, the boy, maybe he, he dies? <laughs> 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 like, based on my son, and I was like, yeah, I don't, no, I don't think the boy's gonna die. Like, I just was like, 
Like, again, if I desperately wanted to work with Sharon Horgan and that's what this project was for, I'd be like, yes, let's kill off the sun. But that's not what right. this project was, so hopefully I'll get to do something else with her, but I just was like, no, I'm not. Right. I'm not going to compromise. I guess what I was saying is, in a, in a world where this gets published and becomes like a bestseller, sure. then you're going to be pitching to the same people who are going to be like, you should have brought this too. It's like I we know, did. I know. I know. We they already won't. did do I that. Know. We, so, had, um, we yeah. had Melbourne's own. I think uh, uh, Graham, who attended RMIT underneath me, wrote a book called The Rosie Project, and and he studied screenwriting and wrote it as a film and couldn't get it made. Uh, I don't know. That might be Graham's fault. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no. But and then he turned it into a book and it. Gangbusters, like Jennifer Lawrence was signed to do the film. Yeah. The film actually hasn't been made, but I think he's done sequels of the book. He's made a lot of money from this book, which I'm sure you yeah. will with yeah. yours. Uh, so, and now, you know, it's, it's a hugely successful yeah. author, yet studied screenwriting. And in, actually, in my, my mentor, um, who I met when I was on Mad About You, is this woman, Maria Semple, and she gave me my first writing job. She was running a show called Suddenly Susan with Brooke Shields a million years ago. And... Um, she actually left TV. She wrote um, Where Did You Go, Bernadette, which is like a mm. big book, and then turned into a movie, which she, I think, wrote the first version of the screenplay for, and then, of course, they took it and rewrote it a million times. But she's left um, TV to write books and teach. But also, she had a book that didn't quite work. Yeah, and she had a book Bernad before that. Where Did You yeah. Go, Bernadette was like the second attempt and was a huge, yeah. you know, in every airport. Uh, Still is, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the amazing thing about writing, right? Is there, there's no barrier to entry, really. Like you can you can create your own destiny. Right. Um, how do, how did you all in the beginning of your careers, you know, make the most of the opportunities that you got? Like Stacy, you got your foot in the door on um, on Mad About You as a writer's assistant. Yeah. Um, Sean Hunter, like, what were some of like the early breaks, or what are, what's some advice that you could give on starting? Well, my, it's very different from my experience here, and I, I've been very blessed and fortunate. But uh, everyone, you know, I lived in LA for the past six years or so, and you hear the stories. If I was an assistant to someone, and you got to, there's a ladder, and you start there, and you work your way up it, and it's really like I have Harvard graduates hand me coffees in meetings over there, and things like it's really. Um, I was a school teacher and um, had an idea for a film and I wrote it <laughs> and then it played can and I kind of jumped to probably a thousand so sort of a, sort screen, of a screenplay can like one screenplay because it's complete like it can change your life I've seen people mm. people go from an assist literally I tried to get the rights to this, this girl I still remember Stephanie Simon I read the first sentence of this script and I said this is going to be an incredible this is, this writer is incredible and she was 22, I think, and we lost the bidding war. It sold for three quarters of a million dollars against like 1.5. Yeah. Um, and that's how fast one screenplay can change. Yeah. I yeah. had a neighbor People. who, um, she was, she called me and she was like, I wrote, I wrote this screenplay, could you read it? And I was like, well, I'm not really, I'm not really the guy for this. And I read it and it was good. And I was like, oh, you know, my agent's uh, assistant, I was like, I'll send it to him, and you know, he could probably help you more. And then, like nine months later, it was like made, <laughs> like it was like a real movie. It's like holy shit, which is like not how it works in TV. And it's like there is much more of a ladder. But yeah, I mean, one one screenplay can definitely break you for sure. So how um, how do you get in your foot in the door in in TV? I don't know. I was going to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you have I any mean, thoughts. I mean, just to explain, like, a, like what Hunter and I did as a writer's assistant is um, we're not an assistant to a specific writer. You are in the writer's room taking notes. And um, the thing that was excellent on Mad About You was that that year there were 18 writers on the show, and it was near the end of the run, so they'd, they'd done every story already. So there were a lot of stories created that um, Paul Reiser and Helen Hunt did not want to do. <laughs> so what would happen is it wasn't good for the writers, but it was good for me because I learned how to break a story. They'd have to break probably three stories or five stories for every one that got sold to them. So you're a writer, you're, you're in the room, but then if you, let's say you break off into two rooms and one room is rewriting a script and the other room is coming up with story, if the, the smaller the room gets, the more they need your help as the writer's assistant. So sometimes they'll say, well, if you have an idea or a thought, please 
at it. So it really, that you learn how the room works, you learn the etiquette of the room, you might get a joke in or an idea in, and then there are certain showrunners, I'm one of them, Hunter's one of them who believe in like, you know, if you get a, if you get extra episodes or you get a second season, you'll give your writer's assistant a script, right? And they might still be a writer's assistant and then hopefully the next season that writer's assistant becomes a staff writer. So there's a lot of people who work their way up that way. Um, it's kind of different now and it's, I don't know, like, I, you know, I meet people, like friends or like, hey, will you sit with this writer and try and talk to them? And I wish I was like, this is what you exactly need to do. Um, but I, it, it's, it's really hard. But the one piece of advice I give everybody is, and I think you guys were talking about this, is like, be social, meet people, um, like, make friends, like, keep, keep in touch with all the people who are in this group. Like, in the first um, impact, my four um, creators, they remain friends. They're still friends. They're all writing on shows now all four of them, um, and they kept in touch no with No promises. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> no, it didn't happen the next day, but, you know, because something might come up and you're, you're working or you're not working or you're busy, and then you go, well, my friend is available, you know? Like um, someone I, I wrote on the show, Daisy Jones and the Six, which at some point is finally gonna come out, but um, based on the book, and this woman I, I worked with, I haven't seen her in three years, and she just you know, emailed me and said, hey, it was funny, it was like, do you have multicam experience? And I said, yeah, and she goes, okay, I've got a young writer, she has a script, she needs someone to supervise her. I was like, yeah. So, so much of it is relationships, um, and even how I got to be a writer's assistant was literally, I went to go have lunch with a friend on the Culver Sony lot, and we talked to someone who was, you know, he was leaving Mad About You, and he was like, would you want to be a writer? Like, it literally was a lunch and a conversation. Yeah. It wasn't me sending out a resume, so. I think it's the best time for TV to be, uh, to be inexperienced or new in your yeah. career and going into, like, I see showrunners that have not written shows. I know. Yeah. Like, that would never have happened 10 years ago. And, and even oh. with film, it's so much harder because there's so fewer films and, the, you know, money's tougher and cinemas and things, so they're reluctant to give a, a first time or a go in film, unless it's an ultra low budget. But right. television, you know, I mean, we're doing Australian stuff. That, you know, that some ones that have come out that, are, you know, I've only got a few. So, and it, there's just a, you know, it's the diversity, it's the new voices. I think yeah. it's beyond exciting. It's amazing. Um, those and opportunities. Yeah. Where what I love you about You don't it have too. to do the runs as much as, yeah, yeah. as you used I, to. I think the thing that's been bad for people in the past with COVID and you know, writer's rooms being on Zoom, Zoom rooms, is it's so much harder for assistants to pitch things when you're on Zoom and there's like, I mean, everyone knows now you have to wait for some person to start to stop talking and then somebody else starts talking. But I mean, for me, it was, it was actually weirdly very similar to Stacy's where I worked with a guy who was a producer on this Nickelodeon show and I was like a post-production PA his wife was working on this multicam called Yes Dear. She, she wanted to leave. She didn't want to be a writer's assistant anymore. She was pregnant. And I basically got the job where she would just train me to become a writer's assistant. I did that. Um, one, of my, one of the co-creators of the show created My Name is Earl. I went over there as a writer's assistant, sort of became endeared to the staff there for some reason. And I wrote, a, I wrote an episode the first two seasons, but I was still a writer's assistant, but I was still expected to pitch jokes and to pitch story ideas because we'd split up. Sometimes we'd split up into rooms that were just writing jokes. And it was just like, here's the script, here's this joke doesn't work and this joke doesn't work. So you get really good when you're in a group of people and you have to write five jokes for every slot and it becomes like, you know, you really, you really uh, hone your skills. So I think that that's, that is what, it's like meeting somebody finding somebody who will champion you and you know, just getting as much experience as you can get. When you're um, supervising writers, whether it's through impact or through um, you know, just projects that you're, you're, you're attached to, um, like how do you approach the, the, the process um, like with, you know, with working with um, you know, up and coming writers? 
Uh, well, like I said, I was, uh, and the reason I did impact the first time, um, well, there was COVID and there was, I had a, had a schedule <laughs> that was opened up all of a sudden. <laughs> so that helped, but... Um, Everything's convenience with you. Uh, yeah, yeah. I love it. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I was a school teacher for like nine years, so I think I have, it was the mix of, and I loved it, um, I just wanted to try this filmmaking thing, but um, it, it was bringing the two th things together, so it was quite exciting, I just loved to see learning and progression and the excitement that comes with when you solve a problem and moving on, so um, more than anything, I think, you know, and this is whether I was teaching prep to year 12 to this thing, is you just want to leave them excited about where they're at and what they've got. So um, that's the most important thing to me because if they're not, it's they're just done with it. And it could be just done with this project or it could be done with I'm never writing again. Mm. And I'd hate to do that to anyone because, um, yeah, that's, that's the exact opposite thing I'm trying to achieve. So really it's just to, to make them passionate and that could be changing it completely that finds them even more excited than the original idea. So I, you know, have people open their mind to anything, but yeah, I just hope that they go away and, and, and run with it um, as the past, you know, few people that I've worked with seem to have done, so. Right. What about you, Stacey? You've been around the horn 14 yeah. times with us. <laughs> I mean, I, I believe, um, you know, that everyone has a story and sometimes people don't even realize, like everyone's life to me is so interesting. And so um, I love like helping people who have this specific point of view, who are coming at something with so many different experiences, especially than I've had and helping them kind of jump through the hoops that you need to do to, to be able to tell that story, you know? Because um, it, is, it is kind of intimidating. The world of TV and film is, it seems sometimes untenable. So I love to be able to say, it's I'm gonna help you through that part of it so that you can tell your story. I'm just like, that's the thing I love the most in every project I've done. Every person's been so different and had such interesting, Stuff And sometimes when it is your own story, it's hard to see how unique and interesting it is because you've lived it. And I love to like hear people's stories and go, oh my God, that's amazing. Like even I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about Vidya in, in my head just because mm -hmm. she was telling an amazing story, but then she would also just tell me stories of her childhood. And um, she, her family lives in Nigeria and she was sent when she was 14 they're Indian, but they live in Nigeria. She was 12. 12 to go to school by herself in India. And this isn't, this wasn't even part of the script that she was writing, but she would tell me these crazy stories about it. And I was like, oh my God, this has to go in your next And the show. only thing that she could do after school was watch um, TV. TV yeah. And she somehow had like gotten access to US, you know, half hour comedies. Right. And her favorite show was Big Bang Theory. Yeah. And then she got to meet Saladin Patterson, who was co-EP co of, yeah. of Big Bang Theory. But she also had this crazy long. story about how her dad, who was in Nigeria, had gone to this restaurant, this like Italian restaurant in India, and he ended up buying a restaurant and making her run it while she was in college. <laughs> so like this is, I was like, this is a whole other show. Yeah. And I would come home and tell him like these stories. And you know, that's just Vidya, but every, every one of my, you know, creators had these incredible life stories that sometimes you can't see yourself that like, oh my God, you have endless amounts of material. I just want to show you that you have it. Mm -hmm. About you. <laughs> yeah. Are you the moderator now? What happened? Yeah. This is weird. I'm Just sorry. Just throwing Tyler. it to you. Um, I think that I, I totally agree with everything you're saying. Um, I kind of have started working with stand ups, and so there's a lot of stand ups. Uh, a lot of them just want to tell one joke and quote unquote stay in the pocket of that joke for 30 pages, and that's that. And it's, it's good to kind of work with them and get them teach them story structure and, you know, sometimes I feel like, you know, imposter syndrome, I don't know what I'm doing, I have no idea. Like, I couldn't really write a book on how to make a TV show, but if you told me your idea, I could tell you how to make that a TV show and how to make that work, and you could do this kind of episode and you could do that kind of episode. Um, so that's what I'm really into, 
And even when somebody like a stand-up is coming, like this is what I, this is the premise, and this is what I think is funny. It's just like going, okay, but what about digging into these things? Um, I, I think that that's especially right now. I'm supervising a project that's uh, with Fox Network that has really. It was originally about two guys in their 20s that find out that they that one of them has a kid and they're going to raise a kid, and it was a single cam. And Fox is like, we love it get rid of the kid, and it's a multicam. <laughs> and we were like, okay. And then like a few weeks later, they were like, do you have a story pitch from us? And I was like, we don't even know what the show is anymore. <laughs> like, we don't really, and like we had to get on a call, like what did you guys like? Like, mm -hmm. why did you buy this? So th for that specific example, it was like, these guys had been working on something. I came in late, and then everything got thrown out anyway. So then we had to really, creatively me and these two other guys come up with the thing and then we have producers with us like Stacy was talking about earlier you have all these partners so um, yeah that was a real experience but I think just the ability to meet people and to go this is what's interesting about your life and this is how you should tell this story um, that's that's the most exciting thing for me what it's terms of supervising helping develop things I think that goes, kind of goes back to what Sean was saying about the scaffolding, you know? 100%, um, yeah. Is that, like, you can't teach talent, in my opinion. You just can't. Because, like, talent is, like, someone's <laughs> life and how they see the world. But you, there's, then there's craft, right? And you can teach people craft. Um, hmm. and, and writers continually, like, get better and better over the years because their craft gets better and better over the years. But it's... It, it's hard to teach like what makes something funny to someone, or mm. that your parents sent you, you know, to India from Nigeria and then wanted yeah. you to run a restaurant. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, I know. think like I was saying, the, this project that we're doing this year, Norfolk, which I put on my list of things that I wanted to do, even though it's not a comedy and it's not a half hour and it seems way out of my ballpark, I still was like, this is something that I could help him with. This is something I could tell him. This is how to do this. Um, anyway, I'm not working on that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can always dive in and lend a hand. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I'm just, I'm just going to pitch. You know, it's it's kind of uh, serious and a thriller and kind of. But I love the Australian history that I had in it, and I'm always like, if something's going to be scary, like make it funny too, and like you know, all these all these great dramas right now. Whether like Succession, that's like a very funny show, and that has a lot of comedy in it, um, even though it's obviously all played Any, straight. Yeah. You said you can't teach talent, and I'll go. You can't teach hard work either. And um, to me, like everyone's got a story, and it's to me, it's, it's just time spent. So you know, having done this a few years, I think the more you put into it, the more you get out of it, um, or anything. Like it's just time spent. It's really difficult. Um, the only reason the craft gets better is because I, I think as a writer you get more time to do it. Like my first film I wrote, I was, I was working full time, studying down the road and I wrote it on weekends. Now how that came out to be any good is beyond me because I hadn't had the time to really do it. And ever since that when it's become your full time job it's nine to five. So it's 80 hours a day, you're just good at it. When you're in a position of studying, you just don't do it as much and all I, could, all I ever tell people is how do you do it I said just sit down and write and it will be bad and you just have to write through it until it is bad there is no quick fix the only way you get good at anything like I, feel, I find it really hard for actors so many of my friends are actors and they're like desperate for that job and they want to get it and they're not nailing the auditions and it's because they're not on set mm -hmm. all the time it's the, you know it's the right. ones that just keep getting the work that get better right. and better they're like how are you so good because they do it all the time Right. And also, um, I think, like, getting a film produced or a TV show produced and being on set, one of the big problems with streaming right now to me for writers is the writers come in and they work for 20 weeks on the scripts or 15 weeks or whatever, and then the showrunner goes off and shoots the show, and the writers don't get any of the producer aspects of casting and wardrobe and all the things you have to do, which really makes you a better writer because you start going... If I write it this way, no one's gonna be able to fucking shoot it. So what's the point? Like, why even write it that way? And you know, there's a there's a thing that that this all reminded me of of trying to help writers break in, who when you talk to them, sometimes they'll say to you like, 
these sound like network notes. Are you just gonna talk like that? I mean, are you just like a network person? And you're like, well, do you wanna get it fucking made? Because these are the things that you have to do to get it made, and if you don't want to, go write a novel. <laughs> yeah. Like, that felt like angry. <laughs> No, but I just want to. No, but like when you're when you're helping people and they're like, no, I understand. You sound yeah. like an asshole. I know. And you're like, well, fuck. no, like you. you, you <laughs> you're like, you, I, I'm helping yeah. you for free. No, you're literally yeah. not allowed to say like, I think it needs the story needs more stakes. They're like, oh wow. Oh you know, stakes! They get so you're like a network executive. Yeah. But, like, but to piggyback off of your, what you were saying, I do think that the beauty of being a writer is. Writing is the only thing that you don't need everyone else for. It's the only thing that you can keep working on your craft and you don't like, an actor needs something to act in, a director needs actors and people, but literally a writer, you don't need anyone else but yourself, so you can keep honing your craft. Well, they need us. Well, yeah. yeah, you guys need us. <laughs> What's the hardest part about being a writer? Is it is it is it is it is it the time? Is it just the, the grind oh, for you, Sean? Uh, what do you for think? me, it's the isolation. Probably these two have each other. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. It's the grind. So typically, I'll spend nine to five. Uh, I think it helped that I didn't start in this industry, so that that typical check in, check out sort of was already instilled in me. Um, and nine o'clock to five, I used to live in Elwood and I would jog Elwood Beach after finishing and I would run and go, you are the worst writer in the world. You are <laughs> just rubbish. What a waste of a day. Um, so it gets a bit debilitating that way. And then every day, <laughs> uh, just, yeah, <laughs> just a bit. And then every day I start my day by reading what I've written the day before. And, and it may be a line, it may be a scene, it may be a moment. Um, where I go, that doesn't suck. That was kind of really quite charming. And, uh, and it's like a writer's applause, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, if I waited until my movies came out to hear the applause, yeah. I wouldn't ever finish a screenplay. So you have to find a moment that instills enough in you to do the next eight hours, and that's what it is for me. Um, so I think it is. It's, it's self-doubt, it's anxiety, it's all those things. It's the hardest thing in the world. Everyone I meet be it directors, actors, DOPs, like grips are like, oh, I want to be a writer, I want to write a script. But it's just too hard, it's just <laughs> yeah. too hard. Like, and it is, it's, it's the hardest part of all of it. Um, I mean, I feel this yeah. way about yeah. screenplays. They're just so long. <laughs> like, yeah. how do you, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. really. They're yeah. way, they are way harder. Um, yeah, well, so. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what about for you guys? What's the I mean, I part? think like, you know, everybody always talks about killing your darlings, which I do agree you need to do, but I feel like just off what Sean's saying is like you have to, your darlings is what keeps you going. And your darlings sometimes are the things that you need to have in a script that's like, well, I know this part's funny, so I want to keep going. Um, so yeah, I think it's staring at the blank page is, you know, what everybody talks about, but I think... I think it's what that really is about is like finding how long is it going to take you to find the thing that really hooks your yourself into this story cuz anybody can go oh this movie's out I want to make a version of that but it's like if you're just writing to do that it's not going to get done and it's not going to be any good you need to find the thing that motivates you and and makes you interested in what you're writing cuz it is for a long time, it is an audience of one. It's mm. just for you. And you have to go, this, it, I'm speaking mostly through comedy, but if it's drama, it's like, what makes you cry? But for me, it's like, what is, what's the funny thing? What's the funny situation that, that I can go, if somebody says, your thing sucks, it's like, well, hold on. This part I know is funny, and this part is great, and you're just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say, I think the hardest part for me is just sitting down and doing it. Um, that's why I love a deadline. Um, and that's why TV, um, when you're on a show and you just like, you have a week to do it, you don't really have a choice. You just have to sit down and do it. Um, you know, writing a screenplay, writing a book, that was a little bit harder. But I know once I like sit down and I actually write, it's like, two, three hours can go by and you don't even know. And like that's, it, it's like the hardest part to sit down, but once you've done it, like my, 
if I can get some writing done every day, it's an amazing day. And I try to tell myself that on the days where I'm like, I don't have time. That even just sitting down for an hour, even just getting a tiny, a one scene written or one page written, I just feel so much better. I don't know if it's good, I don't care. Like, I, I, the process of getting it done um, is what, the, to me, the reward is. So it's just kind of getting myself. And the pandemic's been hard because I don't like to write in my house because there's too many distractions. We have four kids, mm -hmm. so, um, and there's shit to do. You know what I mean? So like, it's very, I'm more, I love to write in like a coffee shop or a restaurant or something. I love seeing like the buzz around me and also not seeing like the dirty dishes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. That, jumping off what Stacey said, that idea of um, I just have to write it, I just have to get it down, I think is really important when people always come up to me saying, you know, is this a, a film or is this a TV show and this idea, I've got this idea. And I always say to them, like, if, if you are propelled to do it and to tell it, and that the end result would be you would have a script and no one will ever see it, let's say, because that's what, 99% of scripts that are written, sadly, like the percentages aren't great, and you will still be content in that, then you cannot lose. And that was me, like Snowtown, I had came up with this idea, started work, and while I was writing it, um, I heard there were other filmmakers that had, you know, because it was based on a true story over here, that, that you know, they were being made. So I was like, oh, I'm nobody, how is that gonna happen? And I went, it didn't matter, like I just had to tell this story. Um, you know, and that's the same, the only specs I've ever written have, have all been stories I had to tell. It wasn't about the money. Um, you know, my last film had so many hurdles in front of it that it would have been ridiculous for me. But if you just have to tell it, and if it doesn't get made, like, you know, then I've got others that haven't, you, you haven't lost, because you've, gotten something out of it. But if you're like, oh, I'm kind of 50-50 on this, I would say don't do it. Right. It's just find the one you are absolutely passionate about and write that because, yeah, like 99% is probably being kind. Right. There's so many that aren't. So do the one you're passionate about. That's why I'm, when I say I'm writing for an audience of one, it's like right. I have to be absolutely just mad about it otherwise. Well, or I yeah, get paid right, really well, and right. then I'll take those. Right, ones. that's what I'm going to say. Yes, if you're and, getting uh, paid, yeah, yeah oh, you don't we can all do that. That's fine. But they're at, like they're assets too that don't only help you in your career because you've written something and gotten better, hopefully. Um, yeah. But I can't tell you the number of projects I have. One, I have a project right now that I sold in 2012 that like might get put together and get made. It's like a major movie at Warner Brothers, like a decade later. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right. Because um, it was a great script. And a lot of times you have to find you have to find the right executive, yeah. the right director, the right time, the right whatever in the market. But there's so many things you can't control, right? Mm. But you can just you can you can control how good your material is, and that's that's kind of it at the end. Yeah, uh, when I was trying to break in, um, everybody was. This was back in the day when you wrote spec scripts of TV shows that existed to show that you could write a comedy within the. So everybody was writing. Curb Your Enthusiasms and Two and a Half Men. Everybody, there was just, everybody was doing the same samples. And so I, being a smart ass kid at the time, I wrote a spec porno, which <laughs> was basically a script that was kind of written in character. So the action lines are in character, like the person's talking to you, the author, um, which was kind of its own character. But it kind of starts as a porno and then kind of becomes a search for the fountain of youth and there's <laughs> action sequences and it's insane. But to this day, people still are reading it, whatever it is, 17 years later. Um, and I wrote it for myself and I, over a weekend and I was like, this is so fucking stupid. I don't, can't believe I'm doing this. But then I had people read it who I worked with and they were like, this is amazing, this is great. And I got an agent from it and then he said, can you please write a two and a half men? And so I did, <laughs> which is super, I don't need, I can't, I imagine a handful of people, but the point is I was passionate about this idea that is really stupid, but when that shows up on someone's desk, they go, spec porno, what is this? Also it's 25 pages, so super easy read. Yeah. <laughs> super yeah. easy, Tyler won't read it, but I'm trying to get him to. <laughs> um, but it, it's like that one out over anything else I've ever written. And it's still like my agent, like, what do you want to send 
I think we should send the porno. <laughs> and I'm like, great. And then also it kind of got enough traction to have some word of mouth in the industry and people being like, wait, you're the guy? And it's like, oh yeah, I'm the guy. And then nothing happens with it. But anyway, <laughs> there's a moment where it's amazing. There, there's a lot of pilots and, and movies that get made, or sorry, made, but, but are written that will, will never have a chance of getting yes. right. Um And that kind of even makes it better because it, they're so wildly original and audacious that yeah. they, they become the thing that everyone in town talks about and says, oh my God, have you read this? Like, yeah. It's never gonna get made, but like right after 9/11, there was uh, there's actually I know one of the guys this writing team wrote a spec that was about a sleeper cell of terrorists in Chicago who like kind of fell in love with America, and then they were like activated to like take down America. <laughs> and anyway, they their agents were like, you can't put your names on the cover page. <laughs> but anyway, that was like a big spec. Um, I have friends that did a, a spec. Uh, Mary Kate and Ashley episode about them getting their first periods, which was like, <laughs> it's just like a thing where like when it shows up on your desk and you've had to read all the, like yeah. you have a stack of just basically kind of this homogenous pile of ideas and then you see a new thing that obviously took some creativity but also some passion to get it done. It's like that's the attractive thing. Yeah. Our, and that's, our friend also yeah. had the, um, he did a mashup between the Wonder Years and the Seinfeld characters because he figured out that they would be the same age <laughs> at that time. So it's like Seinfeld awesome. characters in the world of the Wonder Years and it got him every meeting he's got. You know, he probably yeah. wrote it 10 years ago and it's still his calling card. Cool. Last question I'll ask, or um, it might be more of a commentary and then hopefully we'll get some questions from the audience. Um, I think that a lot of people, they, have this, they want to be a writer, right? But they don't understand, or screenwriter, but how incredibly, um, not only hard it is, but when you're a working writer, like how demanding of a job it is. Like when you have a show in production, mm -hmm. you know, um, I mean, forget about it. And like the, the hours, like you're saying, you know, nine to five on, in terms of like your own, you know, writing process. But when there are those deadlines, when there's this, hey, you know, this Marvel movie is a complete disaster. A friend of mine, um, like he wrote one of the very successful Marvel movies in two days, and it was like a page one. Um, and they had like a couple of multi-million dollar sets that they had to use, and that, that was kind of it. Yeah, you know, and you hear about these insane stories, and, and like I'm pitching this, um, I have to read this book because maybe I might adapt it. Your show running, I mean, can you talk a little bit, maybe? just about that part of the life that kind of, you know, and the more you go up the ladder, the more challenging it gets. I mean, is it me? It's on me. Um, well, we were just talking about this. We did a, uh, a practice panel during, uh, between planes when we were in Fiji <laughs> on our way here. Um, but we were talking about like the importance of taking every meeting um, because you'll get, sent, you'll get sent ideas and you'll look at it and go, I don't, I don't know, this idea seems weird, uh, it's not for me, but always take the meeting and you can find, you can end up figuring out you have your own way into this idea or it can shift to another idea or just meeting the people and making the contacts, I think, is a thing we were talking about. Yeah. Um, that's, that's super important and I don't know, I, I worked with some people who were new and fresh on a show 10 years ago who were like, I'll never work on a multicam. I'll just never do it. And I was like, wait, but you're gonna have like kids and a mortgage and like, <laughs> you're gonna have to work and you're gonna have to have, yeah, it's better to look at yourself as I'm a writer, I can add to whatever project I'm on. Like I can add, so it, it's sort of, I feel like I'm rambling. No, you're good. <laughs> I but mean, I think yeah. like there's no harder job than running a show. Um, it's hard to do other things while you're running a show because you're doing, there's no nine to five, it's 24 seven that you're getting questions and doing rewrites and stuff. But if you're, if you're in development or waiting for that big thing, it's always great to have a lot of things going at once because you don't know which thing is going to go. And then ultimately it's always like, there's like weeks where nothing is happening. And then literally last week before we came here, um, I had to get a rewrite of a pilot done. We were pitching our show every other day. I was pitching another show with two friends of mine. 
Um, there was something else we had to do. I don't know. It's just like within one week, every day, you know, it was like some some nights we get to like you know, sit down and watch, you know, three hours of reality shows. But this was like, okay, after dinner, I have to work. Oh, and you were working on a pitch. We were both literally, yeah. we had like six things going at once in one week. Yeah, I pitched two shows last week. I had three general meetings that, who knows. Right. And uh, this, the Fox project that I'm supervising, we had to do like a light rewrite on that to kind of finalize that. Right. So... Some weeks it's nothing, and some weeks it's every it's day. It's everything. There's three like or four when it rains, things. it pours, which I think is what's so good about this too. The fact that you're thrown in and that you like don't have a long time to to do this. Like in the world of development, this is eight weeks is nothing. You know, because sometimes you can develop things for a year. I year mean, and you a can half. rewrite forever. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it can so always be better. Just like having those deadlines, having to multitask. There's always going to be a moment where that's happening, so I think that's what like the best. This is the best training for that. And you love, you know, it's that. What is it? If you love what you do, you don't work a day. I right. mean, give me two days to write a Marvel film. Sounds sounds kind of fun. Like yeah. you know, I yeah. mean, try thirty kids who are six years old. Like. <laughs> You know, my dad was in construction. These hands have never held a hammer. Like, <laughs> it, 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 it's hard, but it's also, like, I grew up dreaming, you know. I was right. six years old going, I want to do that, and I'm doing it. So, you know, I know you're tired and it's all exhausting, but at the end of the day, I still wake up most days and go, how, how did this happen? You know, so I, I, I will work. I don't even know. Like, I'm, I've been in writers' rooms and I sit there and they have to kick me out. Like, when I get into a story, I forget to eat, I forget to sleep, yeah. and I just, it's not work to me. Um, so, yeah, that makes it, you know, it's, it's all the meetings, it's all the bullshit around it that's mm -hmm. work to me. Right. Yeah, that's what um, my, my therapist said. <laughs> I'm in therapy. <laughs> um, so how crazy is that? Um, but he said, you're not getting paid to write, you're getting paid for all the bullshit that surrounds the writing. Yeah, yeah. Because the writing is like, it's free. I mean, you you're, do you're free. just doing that. And, and I think that that's, uh, like you were saying, it's like you don't work a day in your life. And I think that that's, that's a, a great way to look at it. And it's like, I write dick jokes and <laughs> I get to send my kids, you know, to do cool things and go to summer camp and shit, which is fun. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Uh, any questions from the audience? You said everything. <laughs> In the back. I see someone with a hand up. Either one. On the right. Yeah, sorry. So, um, I was just wondering about your guys' process, whether you actively dedicate time to actually coming up with ideas or, and what that process looks like, or whether they just kind of pop into your head and then you follow that thread. Yeah, we were just talking about this because I think it was one of the sample questions. But in our practice, in our, our mock, pra um, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. in yeah. our layover in Fiji. But um, when you have to come up with an idea, it's it's very hard. Yeah, <laughs> like mm. writing to me is like you can get that done. Writing is writing, but coming up with the idea is to me so much harder than the writing. And a lot of times, and this I think goes. Like there's theories about this of like when you're trying to solve the problem and you spend all the time solving the problem, you can't solve the problem, but then you go on a hike or you're in the shower or you have a dream and the problem gets solved. So, or remembering a name, just stop trying to think about what the name is. Oh right, right, and right. then it pops in your head. Yeah. So we were talking about um, a like a feature that I wrote. Now this is going to sound super bougie, but like I was actually getting a massage. And I know, sorry guys, but this was like. She's in therapy too. 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I am, I am, I am. Um, no, this was like 12 years ago. And um, I literally came up with the entire feature as I was lying there. I don't know why. I just like, because I was relaxed and not thinking about, oh, I have to come up with an idea. I came up with the idea. And then what was your example of that? I watched like 15 minutes of the born identity on the plane. Oh, this was on the plane, yeah. And then I turned on like some meditation music and closed my eyes for like five minutes. I was like, oh, this is a really good idea. And then I just like spent the rest of the time trying to write it on my phone. But I, I think that like, instead of sitting for me, and I think for you also, and 
maybe for Sean or maybe not, but uh, just trying to do something where your brain isn't working, uh, whether it's hiking or, you know, walking around or, you know, I find a lot of ideas in the shower or like just kind of these things where you're on autopilot and you're able to think. Like if you're doing something where you're constantly thinking, it's like your brain's already taken up the t taken up the energy and it doesn't have time to like let it settle in. Um, also for me, being in comedy, it's like just a funny, one small funny thing, even if it's like a title or a bad pun or whatever, which may not survive the development process, it's like that can be enough for me to go, okay, now I got the idea, this is what it is. I think one of the projects this year is um, a grandmother uh, version of Home Alone with a Grandmother, which I'm like, fuck, that's such a good idea. Because it's just like, that's just a great idea that you go, okay, I can write that. And then, oh, I wanted to also mention the having to write a screenplay in two days. I agree that that's amazing. Because then at the end of the day, if they don't like it, you're like, you gave me two fucking days. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. What, what did you want? It's like such a, like, an easy no-brainer. And constraints are good. I like constraints. Yeah. It helps you. When, you. when you can do anything in the world, that's always tricky. Yeah. But if you can The worst, get... yeah, that's the worst. It can be anything. Okay. No. <laughs> I guess. Just tell me what it should be. Rocky written in two days. Yeah. You oh, yeah. uh, I mean, uh, just jumping on, very similar. The idea of sitting there, okay, you've got half an hour to come up with a good idea during a day, it terrifies me. Uh, it couldn't, couldn't possibly happen. Just if you've got a, one good idea, work on that one and others will, will pop in when you least expect it, I would suggest. Um, I heard uh, Shane Black, um, who's just an incredible screenwriter, who I think a lot of his, the productions of his movies don't quite make it to the level of his scripts. But um, I uh, had to talk with him when I was still in college. And one of the things that I thought was great is he keeps a shoebox under his bed that literally is just full of scraps of paper of like ideas that he's had. And he'll just sometimes, if he's like, has writer's block or whatever, he'll just pull it out, pull out a few pieces of paper and it's like, how do these things go together? And, uh, and I think that that's a really good idea because sometimes you have for me, it's like a title or a pun or like a funny log line or something that I don't either have time to dedicate to or just I'm not sure exactly where it goes. Just having those, for me, it's like files on my computer or like a draft of a tweet or something that you can kind of go, ah, what am I going to do? And just start looking mm -hmm. through your old stuff and go, oh, that is a good idea, but it needs to be this, and I think that's important. Yeah, I do something similar, which I think I may have shared with Impact once before, mm -hmm. but being a, a football tragic, I have what I call a ladder. So mm -hmm. a ladder of my ideas on my computer. And when I said, if you've got one good idea, do that, not always the case. So what I find is that we all, when you first have an idea, it is the greatest idea since sliced bread, let's be honest. Yeah. So, mm -hmm you just dive into it and you go crazy, which is great. But I also think what's great is stopping and having time. Um, so what I've created is essentially a ladder in that when I have an idea, I put it in and it might be in fifth place or it might be in 15th or wherever else. And it just stays there. And what's been the good fortune of being gainfully employed for the best part of the decade is that I haven't had time to get to those original spec ideas. Mm. So, you know, it may start at number two and four years later it's down at number 14 and I, and I go, oh, well, it's not probably that great. But the ones that stay at the top, um, Nit Ram, my last film, was one of them. I had a, it took 11 years before I really had time to sit down and do it and it was always at the top. And that, that I think, is, is a good thing to do, is have mm. several ideas and just, just sit on it. Get down what you can and then just have time away from it and if you still come back to it, um, then it's a stick. You know, it's like dating. Everyone's great on a first date. Yeah. But <laughs> three months later, eh, how great are they? So, yeah, you know, the, just... So you have a ladder for that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow, back in the day. Back, back in the day. Back and, they, and they build, <laughs> too, a lot. Um, a great story, because, like, being an executive or being a producer, like, writers will call to bounce ideas off of me, you know, a lot. Or they... Uh, used to, and obviously now we see thousands of ideas um, uh, coming through Impact. 
And there's one story that w it wasn't me. Um, what was the Will Smith, mo uh, Will Ferrell movie where the narrator is like narrating? Stranger Than Fiction. Stranger Than Fiction. Um, so the writer calls the producer and says, I've got the best idea in the world. Um, I believe this story is true, by the way. Um, and this is about, it's about a, a, a person who realizes one day that there's, there's someone narrating their, their life. And the producer said, I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a, fun, a fun idea, but it's not a movie. And you know, a couple weeks goes by, he goes, OK, I got it. Um, there's a narrator that's narrating someone's life, but it's actually a novelist who's writing, like, writes his life, like writes a book, and said, that's a more interesting idea, but it's still not a movie. And then third time called back and said, um, OK, I got it. Narrator, writer is write, writing a book uh, that is his life and tells him that he's going to die. And it's like, now that's a movie. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, it's good. It's good nights. Yeah, so a lot of times it's like, in what I've experienced is it's a scene, it's a character, it's a line, it's a situation, it's this. And then over time, they kind of build on that until it actually, I've seen a lot, a lot of writers I know just write, they just have a scene that they want to write, you know, between a couple characters, and then they kind of build out from there. Yeah, I think it, it's funny because I, I'm on this this flight and I tell her, I'm like, I just came up with like the best idea. She's <laughs> like, what's the idea? And I'm like, well, it's not ready yet. I don't want to tell you. <laughs> and I'm like, no, it's amazing. Cause there's a lot of times where I'll come up with an idea and I'll be like, oh, this is so great. And then whether it's my lovely wife or it's a friend or something and I tell them and they're like, I don't know. Is it really that great? Like. It's sort of like I don't want to kill my own enthusiasm for the thing, but it's the exact thing of like, I know it's not quite ready, but I think it's close, but I don't want anybody to tell me no yet. <laughs> and so it's almost like a ladder in my own head hmm. of this is not ready for, it's probably not ready for me to even write just on my own, let alone share with anyone. Your story also just made me think of this thing that we have this rule where, um, when you're coming up with an idea that you always have to add werewolves. <laughs> yeah. Like add werewolves, like that's like the death thing, like Stakes. add something beyond crazy. Yeah. And then. And then take them out. Take them out, like maybe you don't need the werewolves, <laughs> but maybe you do. <laughs> so we always try yeah. to add werewolves, yeah. Yeah, that was something I was writing. I don't even remember what that it was. It was about, um, was that were the they stewardesses killer thing? stewardesses or flight attendants? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Anyway, anyway, it was very successful. My, <laughs> like, my, equivalent, made. my equivalent to the werewolves would be, um, I, you know, when I studied, it was all write what you know, write what you know, that's the thing. And it still is to this day, and, and I understand what they're saying. But I think when I was studying in Australian cinema history, there was a time where everyone was just writing what they know, not just what they know, what they did. Mm. And, I, uh, and I still see this. I see first-time filmmakers coming out going, here's my childhood would you all like to watch it? Maybe you should have written a book instead. <laughs> you know, it's cheaper. But um, so I always say, write what you know thematically mm -hmm. and then elevate it. Yeah. So I lost my father. I wrote Snowtown. It's about a boy trying to find a father. Just happens to have a serial killer in the background. You know, like a Berlin syndrome, I'm going through a breakup at the same time I'm trapping trees of Palmer in an apartment building. Like, don't just write about it. Don't, I don't want to read a screenplay about a screenwriter, you know, and a heartache or something like that. Like, set it on the moon. You can still do the same scenes. You can still tackle the same emotional things that you want to say, but it doesn't have to be. And I think at the moment, I think it's, it's even a tendency to be, we've, we've gone too far that way where it is, I've got to find, you know, it's exactly, this is the person, I'm just on screen doing my life. And I go, yeah, but your life's not that interesting. Yeah. Like, it's just not. And particularly for film, it's like you've got to, to get, to fill a big, so television I find is easier, people watch it in between ironing and everything else, but take $20 and on the best, <laughs> no offense. It's okay. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, we we but, sent our kids to summer yeah. camp, it's totally yeah. fine. You've got to, you've got to like, Give them just a little bit more sometimes. Just, just take the themes, write what you know thematically, and then bring something else to it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's what I'm saying. Take every meeting because you may go, oh, I, I have a way in that is my own personal experience. Yeah. And it's not going to be, I mean, you know, 
you, if every movie was just based on every, someone's personal experience, it would be like there's no movies about space or <laughs> like nobody nobody right. lived the movie Gravity. Right. Like it's like mm -hmm. you know you kind of got to find what what themes you like, and I think uh, you know that's why if you take a, any writer's body of work, um, it's probably easier to do as for novelists, but there's always kind of like through lines through every book and themes through every book that are explored. Yeah. Got a question? Yes, hi. Um, with respect to series TV, how far would you block the show season to season? And I reference it because of, say, the success of Lost, which then derailed after a few seasons, but they managed to pull it back in the end. Yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting is I think Famously, they didn't know what uh, what was going to happen after the first episode. No, <laughs> after no the pilot. Lost the the story behind Lost actually um, was it was only going to go like four seasons or five yeah. maybe, and yeah. they knew exactly how it was going to end. And then it was a hit, and, <laughs> and Fox said, "Keep it going." And so when it got derailed, it was actually because they they were out they were out of ideas. They had brought it to a conclusion and then weren't allowed to reveal the conclusion. And so right. they literally spun plates. Right. Well, that was, that was also uh, the show 24, when the daughter gets trapped by the mountain lion, was the moment where they were like, we don't know what to do with her. <laughs> yeah. She's there now. <laughs> yep. yeah. right. That don't was very clear. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I, think, I think as far as um, uh, pitching right now, what we're experiencing just for comedy, obviously, Dramas are much more serialized, but I think even in a comedy that's not serialized, they kind of want to know what the season arc is because they feel like this is what keeps people coming back to the show is knowing, trying to find out what's happening with the characters. And then I think, you know, it's season two is kind of this and season three is kind of this and season, I, I mean like three or four seasons of like, I think it's more um, proof of concept than we're gonna hold you to doing these things. It's just like, have you thought about these characters enough to know what happens yeah. down the road? Back back in the day, you know, it, it didn't matter on a on a half hour comedy. They didn't want you to have arcs. They wanted each episode to have a standalone story. So what you would do in your pitch is you would you know, pitch the characters and the world and kind of the pilot story and then you'd give like three sample episodes. Like I imagine this could happen this because like the idea back then was like a hundred episodes, you know? Now with streaming, you know, you're not gonna get more than three seasons. There's probably 10 episodes. So you do pitch the arcs for season one, two and three usually. Yeah. And again, it is just, you're guessing. Mm -hmm. um, as you were also guessing when you were pitching those story, or, you know, oh, here's a story, there's a story. Um, but it does show like that that the show can have legs, yeah. you know. Well, I think what we what we were talking about, and I was talking to a couple of my uh, shapees earlier, is even even now everyone knows that the new buzzword for nobody calls a mini series anymore. Now everything's a limited series. But then it's not a limited series if it's successful. <laughs> then there's yeah. another season. So it's like even if you have this great story to tell that's eight or ten episodes, it's like. <laughs> Yeah, but don't don't set yourself up to have an end. Like set yourself up to have. But at the end of this season, we're shifting into this thing. So I think that's what's important um, in terms of like arcs and knowing. Even if you have this kind of beautiful one season thing, it's like, yeah, but in success. Mind, Mind Hunter was the opposite of all the shows where it was like we had like five seasons in our, in the head. And then David went, that's ah, just too hard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm done with two. Um, normally it's like you're trying to find them and he actually just packed them away. So Interesting. Yeah, I think in impact, I mean, sto stories should be the length that they should be, you know? Um, and so we typically, it's like pilot, first season, um, and then two, like two and three, and, and then however many seasons after that, potentially like the conclusion, like, how does it end, you know? Because mm -hmm. um, then you can be like, well, you can always create new scenarios for the characters um, in a lot of stories, but I think they, people appreciate it when you're like, and then the series finale yeah. is X. And that's what sold Lost. I worked on, uh, on My Name is Earl, and which is all about, uh, you know, a kind of criminal, no good guy 
who makes a list to make up to all the people he wronged. And our creator had like this amazing ending where uh, basically somebody came up to Earl and was like, I have a list of all the bad things I've done. I want to make this thing up to you. And it was kind of like this full circle thing. Um, and it made him feel like, you know, he's sort of changed the world. And uh, kind of notoriously, the show had done well, but it was a 20th Century Fox show for NBC. We do four seasons. The end of season four, we end on some crazy cliffhanger that doesn't really have anything to do with anything. And then the show gets canceled. <laughs> and it was like, and the creator, which everybody felt so bad for, it's like he had this moment yeah. that he just wanted to get to and we never got to it. And then I think, I think he ended up, he did this show called Raising Hope. And then in the background of that show, in an episode on the TV, on TV, <laughs> it was like, <laughs> local, <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> local ne'er-do-well. Da, 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 da. Like, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's so tricky. But like you're saying, it is, knowing what that ending is is so, you know, I would say if you've got an idea and it could be limited or it could be ongoing, Go on going, always. Like, I, I go into rooms and pitch limited and it's so much harder. Yeah. Because yeah. I have to put all the money in and the investment. You know, I've got a, a show I'm doing at the moment where the lead, you know, it's period and the lead character kind of dies and it's done. Like, that, that is it. And it's so much harder to sell than if I was to say, I oh, know, you can, for your investment, you're going to get three years, four years of this. Um, yeah. Well, <clears throat> I think just... Hopefully, people will start doing more. Um, I had a, a show that was serialized. This was the first show that I fell into writing on, and um, it was it was us and Twenty Four were the first two like serialized shows, right? And we got canceled so fast, like after the second episode. And it was a thirteen episode order <clears throat> because serialized television isn't going to work; it's dead. Um, and of course, there was Twenty Four, yeah. um, and but we knew. And, and it, was, it was called Kidnapped, we had an amazing cast, and every season was gonna be a different one kidnapping, right? And so, because we got canceled so quickly, we had the ability to do a 13 episode limited series, and it ended up being great, because like, I still get residuals and things on that, because people watch it because it's complete. It's yeah. right. one thing, so I think right. advice would be too, if you don't get picked up, you know, have your have an ending to your season that is that is not necessarily like a series finale. Like it could go on, but it it could it could live as a limited because the story that you told in the first season was a complete story. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you have the, you know, if you do get the pickup, you know how you're going to launch it into the next season. Like you have that in your back pocket. But if you get canceled, like you. A count on getting canceled. <laughs> and, and very few shows get to say, I'm, "This is where I'm going out." Yeah, and be lucky, yeah. and just yeah, and just be lucky if you get the next one. I know we're over time, but uh, maybe we can do one more question or a couple. You know, I'm s Hi, um, I was just interested in your take on the difference between the Australian and American models. In Australia, it feels like we champion the auteur, writer, director model a bit more. Um, if I'm just a screenwriter, it feels a little bit harder. Like I'm, I'm not pushing the thing forward as much as they are in Australia, in, a, in the UK, in the US. Sorry, if that makes sense. Yeah, just your difference, but your ideas on the difference between the different models in America and Australia. For f film or television, we just in general. Just, just in general. Yeah, just in general. Your thoughts. Uh, yeah, look, I think. I'll take it because I guess Please I know this it. plays pretty no well. Idea. I'm just going to listen to you. Um, I think it's it's slowly changing, but yeah, I agree. I think the, this country has been writer director obsessed to a degree, um, and uh, and writers have had to fight for the respect that they deserve, um, and it's probably still ongoing. Uh, but, you know, it, it's certainly a lot easier now than it was when I started. Uh, and I've been really strong. Like, I, I don't much like doing things like this and I don't much like doing... Oh, no offence. <laughs> or, 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 or articles or anything like that. And the reason I do it is so that it's easier for the next people to get a face because writers don't have faces. Um, they just see the actors and they just see the directors and they go, wow, they've done it all. That's amazing. So the only reason I do it is because for that for that reason, um, is to gain a little bit more respect, um, to know that, yeah, this is where the ideas start. 
Um, so it is, um, yeah, it, it's challenging in that regard. But you, you kind of have to do it. But it worked out, you know, it works really well. I think, uh, as I said, I became a writer because I'm cheap, essentially. And uh, I went to the cheaper course. But, but there was also part of me was that there were a lot of writer directors at the time. Um, and, and, uh, and they just do their little thing. But there's also like this handful of really, really great Australian directors. And, and to get them, sometimes you need a script. <laughs> and they didn't want to write them or, or couldn't. And uh, I managed to find a niche where I was writing these scripts and being able to work with Kate Shortland and Justin Gazelle and Rachel Perkins or whoever else because I was I just focused on that. And, and that was kind of my decision. And whether or not that changes, I don't know. But I said I was going to be the, um, what is it, jack of all trades? I, didn't, I want to be a master of one before I try to take on the world because they're so very different things. I still have writer directors, um, ironically, an uh, American gentleman who has only made one film, but he would have all the, all the time say to me, direct it, You're, you know the story best, you should direct it. And I'm like, well, what if I'm not the right best person to direct it? And he says, but you know the story best, you are. And I said, I think they're very different skill sets. You know, and, and why wouldn't I want to make it better? My ego is not big enough to go, only I can touch this thing. So I, I always said, if I'm the best person to direct it, I will direct it. I've just been very fortunate that really good directors have walked through the door, read my scripts and said, I want to direct it and I haven't had to. But, but he was adamant that you should. And I'm like, there's nothing wrong. We don't have to do everything. Um, as I said, write a novel or, or work in teams with people. Is, I think it's also, um, it's not unique to Australia, uh, and hopefully programs like this um, are, will, will change it uh, uh, more in this country. We just did something with Netflix in, in Germany, and the re now that sort of, you know, local language content is really taking off in all these markets, um, as the minister said, like, people want to see um, their own people, hear their own language, their own accents, et cetera. So we did this... Um, thing for Netflix doc, which is all the German language speaking um, countries, because Germany's taking off, or, or for Netflix now, all their growth is going to come internationally. And I know Australia is a priority, and so is Germany, and Figs, France, I Italy, Germany, Spain, <clears throat> um, Latin America. But there's no writers, and there's no there's no ecosystem. Like Hollywood and the UK are the two places where it's like you can be a writer, writer. That's a thing. It's a job, it exists. In Germany, it is not a job. Like you can't say, like, I'm going to be a writer, or even like in France and or in Mexico. And so the people who I've met, like they had to write and direct and produce and raise the money. Some people star because they have no choice. Like they want to be a filmmaker. They have to do everything themselves. And so part of what, you know, not part of what we're doing here with, um, with Impact Australia and with other potential partnerships around the world is to start to create, um, you know, ecosystems of writers uh, because you can't, you cannot have local language content or uh, if you don't have the, the writers. And so I think that it's, um, I think it's going to be changing because with shows like Lupin and Fauda and like, you know, all of these dark and these, you know, huge global shows, um, there's an appetite for audiences to see people who are different from themselves and see like unique stories. Do you have a question? Yeah, 100%. Um, 100%. Uh, I worked with, uh, they were a writing team on um, Always Sunny, and then they've split up and done many more things, but uh, Martyr and Roselle, they wrote, um, they were obsessed with 80s action movies, specifically Cobra with... Um, with <laughs> Crime is a disease, I'm the yeah, cure. Exactly. So, <laughs> um, so they, they wrote a spec, spec screenplay called, I think the character is called The Doberman, Anyway, it was like very funny, got them tons of meetings, but they couldn't get the movie made, so they did it as a comic book. Um, my, uh, our friend has this idea, uh, had this idea forever about genius animals, which nobody wanted to do, obviously, <laughs> and uh, so he, he made a graphic novel that just came out last year. So I think it's like, there are many different pathways. 
I think people probably know about the Matrix and about how they wrote it, and people were like, what the fuck is this? So then they hired their friend to like storyboard it and do like big sweeping panoramas of what shit would look like, which I think a lot of times it's just like, everyone in Hollywood just wants to say no, because it's like just the easiest thing to do. So sometimes you just gotta go, no, 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 this is what it looks like, this is what it is. So, and I think it's, now it's even better because it could, you can make a podcast, you can make an audio book, you can make a million different things and go, I actually, uh, me and my friend have a thing that's being set up at Disney Plus and I was, but it's taking forever because of all these regi regime changes and everything. And I like texted my agent and I was like, what do you think if we got this published as a comic book first? And he's like, they already own it. You can't do that. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, but I know, but if it was a comic book, they would get it. Yeah, um, but like Heartbreaker was like that online graphic novel that's now a show. And I, not only like, let's say you, you can't draw, like, um, I, I wrote um, a one act play and like put it on at the Fringe Festival and like that went well and like I turned that play into a feature. So like that's a really, it's just really smart kind of to come at the problem or that, you know, my friend just directed that film, I think it's called Cat Person, that was just like a short story, you know, a short story, an article, anything, any creative output, you know, yeah. any way to tell the story you know, is a good way and it becomes IP, which people love. I should also say the guys that got it made into a comic book and my friend who uh, turned his thing into a graphic novel, neither one of them, none of them were artists. And they just, they had written the script and they got, they went and found an artist and self, one was a self-published thing and then the other one was through a comic book company. But yeah, I mean, you can find people, again, collaborate with people, find people that you love. Um, yeah, I think Fringe Festival is great because there were multiple people. Yeah. Your guys' show, well, do you have three? Yeah, we did three one-act three one-act, one act, and it was all TV writers who had kind of like a thing that wasn't fully working as a TV show or wasn't quite a TV show anyway. So I think that's really good. And we saw a Fringe Festival billboard. It kind of goes back to what Sean was saying too about like that great idea. Like if it's a great idea and it's a great story, find a way to tell it. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. find a cheap way. You know, um, and because because once if it is a great story, it just becomes undeniable. Was that one? Yeah, yeah, no, you had your hand. Ah, <laughs> very good. Well done. Um, so, um, all of your projects have been live action based, um, but I'm sure like much like the show, there might be a live animation. And this year, I have picked up the Beckham Brothers of Water, which is like a Warner Brother. Well, I had an animated show last year with Impact and worked on it, and then I've started doing an animated thing myself recently just because, uh, and because there's a huge desire for it. Like, it's so, so popular at the moment. Um, so if that's your world, then it's a good time to be in it because, yeah, yeah it's just an insatiable appetite for give it. A, <coughs> I give a, re a relatively quick anecdote on a long story? Um, and then I, uh, I think we need to, to wrap it up. But, but I, I became the head of, Imag of animation for uh, Imagine. I had no experience, zero experience in, in animation. But I had met... Uh, Very classic Hollywood story. Yeah, I had met the guys from Animal Logic. They had a project that they brought to, they wanted Ron Howard to direct. I really loved the project. Um, it's actually now being made and Ron is directing it. Um, it was the first project that I, I brought in, <clears throat> and Animal Logic um, had a very, very different philosophy. Zari Nalbandian, who's the CEO of the company, and um, they did all the Lego movies, and unlike every single other animated company, they have a screenplay first. They actually have a script, where every other animation company starts with drawing. And because they're, that's what the, the guys who started Disney animation and all that, that's what they, they were artists first and then storytellers second. And 
the short version is if you have a good story, it could be live action, it could be animated, it, 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 it doesn't matter. Like a good story is a good story. And so I had no experience. Everyone in animation said, you don't know what you're talking about. Animation's different, animation's different. It's not, it's not different at all. Um, the process of the filmmaking is much different. Um, but for many years, they operated in a very different way. And I think it's changing. I think it's different um, like um, with Chris Melodondry, with, with uh, Animal Logic. And you're seeing more and more you know, animated scripts, animated television shows first as screenplays and not as um, animated shorts and, and other things the way that they, that they used to do it. And by the way, still obviously Disney, Pixar, it's massively successful the way that they do it, but it's not the only way. Um, and so I think that is changing and it's making it more accessible to writers who don't have experience in animation. Cool. Yeah. Thank you all so much. And thanks for listening. Thank